It's time a human construct. It's Mini Myth Monday, here in Mikey's Lab. Hi, and welcome back to the lab. If this is your first time joining us, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below to ensure that you get all the latest news on science, engineering, DIY, making, and now Mini Myth Mondays that we put together for you every single week. Time is what keeps everything from happening at once. Well, time itself was obviously not created by humans. How we define it, how we predict it, how we measure it, are definitely concepts that were derived from the human mind. There is more to this story though. The brain itself has at least five key centers that are affected by or dependent on time. Today we're going to take a look at those centers, we're going to look at how the brain interacts with time, what time is, and if the human brain could possibly survive time travel. Anybody who's ever watched a science fiction TV show or even the Big Bang Theory can know how much of a mind warp it is to try to comprehend time travel with our normal thought processes. So lab code up. We're going to learn something today. So what is time? Probably one of the most concise descriptions or definitions of time that I have come across on the internet and in my daily life is that it is the indefinite progression of events and moments in, in a forward manner from yesterday to today to the future. Now from a physics standpoint, this isn't all there is. From a physics standpoint, there is no reason to assume that we cannot slow down time, speed up time, stop time, or even make time go in reverse. Although all of these would do a pretty interesting job of messing with several key areas of your brain and it might not have the effects that you think it would. Let's look at these five areas of the brain. Let's look at how time interacts with them and how they interact with time and our perception. How things move from our subconscious to our conscious and how the brain keeps track of the constant tick of the march towards entropy. The five centers of the brain that are believed to have the most dependence or the most interaction with time are the stopwatch, the memory center, the sequence sorter, the beat keeper, and the reward center. And take a look at these individually and talk a little bit about what they are, what they do, and how they're dependent on time. The stopwatch functions very much like it sounds. It is a function of the supplementary motor area of the brain. What this does and the way that this works with time is it brings in stimulus and it keeps track of how long that stimulus has been in place and increases the response to the stimulus as time goes on. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, if you're walking through a grocery store and you smell a fresh apple pie baking, the first time you smell it, you won't have a huge reaction to it. This is all, of course, subconscious at this point. But as time goes on and you continue to smell the apple pie more and more and more, the response of this area of your brain starts to get bigger. And it starts to bleed into the conscious level of the brain itself. To the point that you will eventually start craving some apple pie. The next in our list is the memory center. This is a part, or at least a skill, that I myself have a lot of trouble with and I know several other people do too. And that's judging the time between events in our memory. So for example, you, two things happen, right? You throw the ball, it bounces off the wall. The time between throwing the ball and bouncing off the wall and being treated as separate events inside of your brain um, can start to blur as, as time passes for, uh, from the event. So what the memory center tries to do is it tries to keep a start time of each event and allow you to compare them across each other. Right? So you can tell how long something actually took. 
This will be addressed a little later in another part of the brain too where we talk about how dependent our brain is on short-term memory for its timekeeping operations. The sequence center is the next part we're going to look at. What it does is it uses time codes, it uses time scale to determine an order or natural order of things in a process. For example, imagine if the part of your brain that knows how to dance and remembers every step in a dance lost the timekeeping functionality of that. So now you know all the moves, you just don't know what order or what time scale to do them in. This might actually have been what happened to my ability to dance, but I don't know. So it goes without saying, without that time scale or that time code of information inside of our brain, knowing the steps of how to do something, not just dancing, but just a, a procedure in general, not being able to see the order of progression, right, and work through that way as a function of time makes that information completely useless. The beat keeper section of our brain, or the cerebellum as it's more, uh, more accurately known, is responsible for controlling motor movements. Uh, things that have time code movements to them, such as tapping your foot to the beat of a song. This is all handled by this particular area of the brain, and the time coding and the way that it handles that particular information is critical to how that works. Without time-based information in the cerebellum, almost all of our physical activities would just not be possible. All right, so the next section of the, of the brain is one that a lot of people enjoy, and you should. It's the reward center, located in the basal ganglia of the brain. It handles the rewards that we feel and does calculations and risk-reward scenarios for whether we're going to do something to try to get a reward out of it. We'll look at a modern example, okay? For if you're one of the billions of people out there that happen to enjoy a chocolatey treat, this particular part of your brain will kick in when there's the possibility of one coming and you have to wait. Now, the scale that you're willing to wait obviously changes based on what's going on in your life at the time. If you're late coming back from lunch from work already, you're probably not willing to wait as long. However, if you're just at home watching TV and you send somebody out to get chocolate, you're probably willing to wait almost indefinitely. It is this scale that changes and this is how it uses time. When this particular part of your brain starts to calculate the risk reward for getting that particular chocolate you treat versus how much time it has to wait in order to get that treat, as the time ticks by, it changes the signals it sends up to the conscious level of our brain. This is another way that while we detect and interact with time at a subconscious level in a lot of our systems, it can bubble up back into the conscious level. So like almost everything in neuroscience, neuroscientists are still debating as to how a collection of neurons, a collection of cells, keeps track of time. One of the most recent theories that I've read, and one that I, I happen to believe is probably pretty close to accurate at this point, but we will we'll never know. Neuroscience is one of those things where it's, everything changes all the time, is population clock theory. So the idea is that any part of your brain can keep track of time. Any collection of cells can keep track of time. A stimulus comes into your brain and the neurons start firing and they keep firing much like the frequency of a quartz crystal inside of an electronic system or computerized system to give our brain that time code that it needs for memory and for all the other sections that we just talked about. One of the more interesting questions I've heard regarding the brain and time as of late is a question as to whether or not our brain can actually handle time travel. We've already seen in this video how dependent on a consistent flow of time our brain actually is. So those systems that are running subconsciously and are dependent on and are interacting with time, there's really no way to know what will happen if suddenly it jumps around. Will our hippocampus be able to adapt to this? Will our memory still stay fluid and in a linear pattern? Nobody knows this, obviously. 
Uh, if you watch any sci-fi show or the, a couple of the episodes of The Big Bang Theory where they start to discuss time travel theory, it becomes very, very confusing very, very quickly. From all this, we can easily, easily define that time is not a human construct. It obviously existed and parts of our brain that still use it come from the most primitive of humans in our evolution. When talking about time, especially when it comes to measuring it, defining it, and working with it in our reality, it's hard to not turn around and mention that in physics, it is almost inseparable from space. It is always referred to as space-time, and it is represented as the fourth dimension. Just like everything else, how we define it and how we measure it is definitely a human construct, but it's the same that we do for width, depth, height. Um, so to say that, that time is a human construct and it isn't really real is kind of a misnomer right out of the gate. Time and space are linked so intertwined that it is virtually impossible to separate them. To the point that gravity something that we understand to interact with matter also warps time. Bonus fact, the way that you perceive or the way that you will express time is very dependent on the writing style of the culture that you grew up in. For example, if you grew up in, let's say, the western part of the world where writing goes from left to right and progresses in that order, if you were asked to draw an arrow expressing the flow of time, chances are you're going to draw that arrow from left to right. Contrary, in places where, uh, where words that you would read and where the literary style is to go from right to left, if you are asked to draw an arrow showing the progression of time, chances are you're going to draw it from right to left. And shocker, and you're probably going to be able to get ahead of me on this one, for places where the writing goes top to bottom, the arrow also goes top to bottom. It's just interesting that something that is so consistent, that is something that is so constant across every civilization, every culture, every creed, can still have differences in perception. So tell me what you think. When you think about the concepts of time, when you think about the concepts of space, when you think of the ways that we already know that time travel may be possible, and the ways that it can already happen, let me know in the comments down below. I would love to have a conversation with you guys about this. Thank you for joining me in the lab today. If you haven't already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below to ensure that you get all the latest news on DIY, science, engineering, technology, making, and now Mini Myth Mondays that we put together for you every single week. Once again, thank you for joining me in the lab. I will see you next time.